Hey guys, just a quick disclaimer before we begin. This episode contains content that some listeners may find disturbing, so maybe don't listen with children around. Okay, now that's out of the way, on with the show. Hello internet, and welcome to Ramblings of a Madman. I'm Alex, and I'm joined by Sean and Stuart for a shallow and probably uninformed dive into unexplained mysteries, conspiracy theories, and the supernatural. Hi, how are we doing today, guys? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm the same as always. <laughs> Can we redo that again? Because I was... <laughs> you were muted. I was, I was, but you two were also so robotic in your, yes, I'm fine, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm a robot <laughs> while I've been locked in this tiny room. <laughs> I, I'm happy keeping that in now. <laughs> I'm fine, how are you? <laughs> we are friends in real life, seriously. <laughs> I swear, we are normal human beings. Uh, I mean, I'm not. No. <laughs> Day, uh, what was it, week 127 yeah. amorphous it's blobs. The prim- oh, yeah. the, for some reason, the primordial ooze has developed into a robot. <laughs> primordial ooze, that's it, yeah. <laughs> Evolution happens, you can't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Uh, so today, we're going to do a bit of a format change. Uh, there's a lot of uh, topics that we come across on this podcast that we want to cover, but they often tend to be a bit short, or they tend to not have a lot of discussion that's possible with them. So, for example, like, The Man from Torrid would be an example of that, where it just resulted in a really short episode. Uh, so today, all three of us have brought a little topic, and we're going to do sort of a mystery show-and-tell sort of thing. Here's one I made earlier. Yes, is, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, it's now Blue Peter. <laughs> I was thinking smart or art attack, but, yeah. Yeah, sure. Really telling everyone our age there. Yeah. <laughs> Mid nineties, definitely. <laughs> I used to love Art Attack. <laughs> right, okay, I'm up first, and I have brought a very special topic which I first heard about on Reddit, um, the Unsolved Mystery subreddit, and it was posted by a guy called El Gringo Exotico, which is a great what name. a name or a woman. It could be a woman. Oh, uh, El Gringo is uh, a derogatory term for a white person. Okay, the, well, the pretty much know. fits Alex then. <laughs> Come on, Gringo. Not very, not very, not very exotic, though. <laughs> Look, it's 2020. I'm not allowed to point out that I'm that I'm a Gringo. <laughs> Stop saying the word. <laughs> <laughs> in, in before it's really racist. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. But well, we might have to, yeah, we might have to backtrack on that. <laughs> <laughs> right, carry on. <laughs> uh, this is a topic I first heard about on Reddit on uh, unsolved mysteries, and these are called the Erd Stalls. Uh, oh, okay. I'll put a link in the description for the um, the Reddit link. Mm-hmm. Uh, so scattered throughout Europe is a network of underground tunnels known as Erdstalls. There are around 2,000 of these known tunnels, with the majority being located in Germany and Austria. An Erdstall system is made up of narrow tunnels that have been curved into a smooth ovular shape. They are very low and narrow, being 1 to 1.4 metres high and around 60 centimetres wide. The individual tunnels are linked by even smaller passages called slips, and these are impossible for less nimble or overweight people to pass through. These slips can be vertical or horizontal. So I think the guys are Wikipedia for Erdstalls, and there's some photos, um, example photos of the tunnels. And you can see these slips here, and it looks like these people have just been welded in to the mm-hmm. rock. Yeah. Because yeah. the, the, the tunnels are so narrow at this point. God, you wouldn't want to get stuck in one of those, would you? No. Well, you said about... Uh being slightly overweight you were, or whatever, you wouldn't be able to get through. They're literally just kids. In that first picture, it's just a kid trying to get through. The second guy's a, a grown-up, but he's, like, crawling on his hands and knees through one. Yeah, no. I'm really quite claustrophobic anyway. Mate, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just looking at it, it makes I'm me feel comfortable. <laughs> he's got a... The guy in the second picture's got a proper, like, here's Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Less of the axe. Less of the axe, yeah. To be fair, I'll be clear, we already did one take and Stuart delivered that joke a lot better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> I just tried to nick it before he got in there, but it didn't work out very well. <laughs> okay. How deep under the ground are these, Alex? 
I don't think they go very deep because um, okay. they're very short systems. Mm -hmm. But the um, the slips can be either vertical or horizontal. So if you imagine that you've got tunnels side by side and then you have slips between them, or you can have tunnels um, above and then going deeper into the ground so you'd have uh, vertical slips uh, to drop down between them. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, another trait that all words dolls have in common is that they have only one concealed entry point. So at the at very start, there'll be one entry and there's no exit. It'll be a dead end at the other end of the tunnel. Okay. There are a number of different classifications for Earth Star Tunnels because some of them are very complex with multiple levels joined by vertical slips. At the end of most tunnels, there is a larger room in which seating niches have been carved out of the wall. Uh, there's a photo of that as well. That's the third photo on, on Wikipedia. So you can see these guys like sitting on benches that have been carved out of the walls. Mm -hmm. They're very like tightly packed into, these, uh, into the end of this tunnel. Uh, they are almost all found in rural areas, often being located under old farms, churches, or cemeteries, but sometimes they're just in the middle of nowhere. So, in terms of the age of these bird star tunnels, uh, it's kind of hard to narrow it down because we've got almost no archaeological material found in them, and mm -hmm. there's also no written accounts of them being in the historical record. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we look at medieval Europe, all the uh, priests and... Uh, friars and all those people wrote everything down all the time, like yeah. books and books of like, this is how we did farming. This is how we build houses, mm -hmm. literally everything you can imagine. And these aren't mentioned anywhere in the historical record. Okay. Um, the few datable finds that we have recovered from the tunnels, uh, such as coal and ceramic material, give us an age of around the high middle ages. So this is the 10th to the 13th century. But these mm -hmm. items probably don't date to the construction period. So that's what I talked about with when we did Stonehenge. So we've got the items related with the, the monument or the tunnel, but mm -hmm. they were probably left there by people afterwards. So it didn't yeah, say yeah. the exact yeah. time it was built. So you've got any idea what these could be for off the top of your head? Well, straight away, the first thing that popped into my head, which already with the dating and everything that's been refuted, you said they were in Austria or across Europe. Yeah, there's some in Ireland, there's some in Scotland. Right, okay, uh, okay. France. So my my first thing was like just underground shelters to hide. You said mm -hmm. they've got concealed entrances and stuff. So what I was going to do originally was say well, World War Two, World War One, you know, bombings, yeah, et cetera, especially in like, you know, around Austria and the key places you'd where, where the war would have happened. But then you could apply that. I'd, I'm not saying there would be bombs. <laughs> In the Middle Ages, at all, but they'd still. But there still would be people being pillaged. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So maybe they had some of their. Well, but then, in at least some of the earth stalls, wouldn't there be the chance of finding some valuables or remnants of something? We haven't found any valuables in them. We've pretty much only found like coal, bits of wood, uh, ceramic material, mm -hmm. or something like that. But it was like all cracked and just pieces on the floor. The thing that came to me straight away was, uh, and it's probably actually the wrong uh, geographical location for it, but I thought at first this was going to be like piracy, like there'll be smuggling tunnels or like somebody's treasure trove, if you see what I mean, hidden yeah. away, like buried underground. But then, but then that, doesn't, that doesn't quite fit with the lack of things found, but unless they were always used as temporary storage grounds... I was going to say, because if they were smuggling tunnels, they'd have an exit or two. But it does make sense of them being story tunnels. But the way that in that third photo, they've got, they've got seating areas. That makes mm -hmm. me think that people would have used them to sit for long periods of time, so they were more comfortable. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yep. Um, most of them have these seating areas, and they almost always tend to be at the end of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. So I've got sort of three theories on what these could have been used for. The mm. first, as I don't know who mentioned it, but someone mentioned it, uh, for storage. But the, the problem with this is that the pastures are very narrow, so it would be very impractical to, to be lugging things down these, especially yeah. through those slips. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. How would you get through those slips? But the slips are... Some of them are vertical, though, aren't they? So theoretically, dropping stuff down them wouldn't be that difficult, but it'd be then retrieving them, wouldn't it? That would yeah, be but then if I, I agree with what Alex is saying, again, not really for storage, because if you drop them in, 
surely if it was literally just dropped them in like that, you'd have just a hole. You, you yeah. wouldn't have like an elaborate tunnel system. And you wouldn't you wouldn't make the tunnel small, you just keep it the same width. Mm-hmm. True. Um, and another problem with them being used for storage is that they're often below the water line, so they tend to flood. Ah. Okay. Wait, Which so you okay. might not have known at the time as well, to be fair. Yeah. So would they have flooded well. then, though? I know the landscape changes over time, but would they have been under the water level then? Or I, I believe have... so. I don't, I don't think water lines change very much over time. Well, I was just wondering if... Is it because they're under the water line that they're the shape they are? Like, is there any chance that this is a natural forming? This is um, definitely not natural. You can see the tool marks on the walls and stuff. Yeah, but I suppose it would have smoothed itself gradually over time, wouldn't it? A bit more than it being really sort of harsh. But yeah, you can see the tool marking. Yeah, and they're, they're all very similar in construction. So and the fl- like that would be natural. Is the floor of each of these erd stools as solid as the walls? So the, and what I'm wondering is... It seems to all be the same rock. It all looks the same rock. Yeah, what I was wondering was, could these have been bigger and they've sediment filled in and then people have dug through the sediment and that's why the passages are more narrow if they're below the water level? Why would you do that, though? Oh, because of the water. Right. As in, were they bigger prior and they've filled in, but the rock looks too uniform, doesn't it's it? Rock. rock wouldn't have formed in... 13th century, so what, 900 okay. years? Fine, okay. There would still be mud. Hmm. Okay, uh, second theory is, as Sean mentioned very first, uh, hiding places. So in times of need, people could take temporary shelter in the earth stalls with their valuables. Based on this theory, it's assumed that the slips are there to trap the oxygen in each section so the people could move from one section to the other as the air supply ran out. Okay. So that gives yeah. you... um a longer ability to stay in these tunnels if you keep going deeper down into them and follow the pocket of oxygen. Um, the problem yeah. with them being hiding places is that there's only one entrance and exit, and so there's no way to escape if you're found. And also, this single entrance means that the air supply to the entire system can be cut off just by blocking the first tunnel. Oh, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, that, that yeah but also the, purpose, the, the person you're hiding from or the people you're hiding from or the thing you're hiding from wouldn't potentially know that there is no other exit. So blocking the entrance, I don't know what I was going to argue. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. I, I, I don't think the, I understand what you're saying. Like it is a worry, but the person tracking you or the thing tracking you wouldn't like think in my head, at least to block the thing uh, for like, in terms of a hiding place, yeah. like the first thing I worry about wouldn't be, oh crap, they're going to lock me in. Because if they're trying to find you, they would just find the hiding place and then find you, right? Yeah, yeah you, it you might just be hard to pull you down into the tunnel. Since it's okay, so true, bad. true. Especially if someone's wearing like, well, I don't know, medieval times. I'm just thinking like full plate armor. No, it's too <laughs> early. Full plate. Too early. Okay, okay. I mean, that's also assuming it's a military. Yeah, like. Um... Pillaging like bandits and stuff probably wouldn't have very good equipment anyway. They'd have had like leather, wouldn't they? No, they leather leather armor wasn't real. That's fantasy. They'd be wearing um gambeson most likely, which is like a uh, thick thick linen. Okay. The thing is that you've ruined for me here though, is that every single RPG I've ever played has lied to me about my yeah. level one armor being leather. Yeah, yeah. leather armor is not real. <laughs> so I killed all those cows in RuneScape for absolutely nothing. Yeah. So no one no one had leather armor. We haven't found any um, examples of it oh. in the historical record. Put it that okay. way. So if there was leather armor, we haven't found it. People wore leather clothes, mm-hmm. like boots and stuff, but they, they wouldn't have worn it as armor specifically because Gamberson was better as armor and it was cheaper. Fair enough. And mm-hmm. it was easier to make. Like You didn't need a, a leather yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. A leather <laughs> A leather smith. A leather worker. A leather smith. worker. No, a leather guy. A tanner. A tanner. There we go. A tanner. <laughs> uh, okay, moving on. Uh, the, the third theory I've got, and the final theory, is that these could be of use uh, for religious use. So it's highly unlikely that these were for Christians, because as I said before, the priests at the time wrote everything down. So perhaps it was sort of pre-Christian worship. Mm, like paganism. Paganism stuff that would have been frowned upon, and you wouldn't want to do openly. Mm. But then, 
in terms of like if there was like a shrine or something down there or a place to pray or something like yep. wouldn't there have been remnants of that yeah you think so? well yeah but there was there was didn't you say there was like bits of coal so theoretically maybe there could be a small fire well, from, pit from fire pits maybe or torches that people were carrying which would make it really hard to breathe yeah it would i don't know but we haven't found any religious artifacts at all and there's nothing carved on the walls Mm. Okay, one thing. Are they clearly man-made? Yes. So, like, you look at that second photo, they've put all this effort in to digging out that quite elaborate uh, ceiling because it's, like, pointed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right? And then you've got this tiny little crack at the bottom. To me, that just looks like someone found a hole as they were digging and then decided to use that instead. Well, the reason I say they're definitely man-made is because of so many similar similarities between all of them. Right, okay. And uh, also the way they're laid out. Like, they tend to be quite complex. Okay. With this larger room at the end and seating and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. What I was trying to say is, I, I know, looking from the pictures, especially with those little seating areas, they wouldn't be natural. The way that they, they look like little al- alcoves, don't they? Mm-hmm. Um, I understand that, but would they have been excavated from a natural formed cave system and then... Yeah, they definitely could have been. Right. Okay. Someone could have found a natural cave system to make their job easier. Mm-hmm. But there's so many of them and they're all so similar. Exactly, that's the question, isn't it? Across the whole of Europe as well. Across the whole of Europe. I, I said there was, um, there's about 2,000 of them. Maybe it was the fashion. The thing that's weird about it is that Okay, yes, there are 2,000, it sounds like quite a lot. But when you think of the entire landmass of Europe, and there are only 2,000 networks of tunnels, that's not particularly commonplace. Now, network is a strong word as well. If you look at the, the fourth, apparently that's the biggest. Oh, no, that's a map of the large Erdstall in Badzell. So that I, I read that as biggest. But yeah, it's not particularly... Yeah, you're right, though. It's not a particularly big tunnel no, network. It, to me, it's not like... They're not big enough to be like an underground, yeah. like society or anything like that. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from the more people. <laughs> from the more people. Well, it, it, it does make you wonder whether or not, uh, like folklorey kind of stuff comes from these things, though. Can you think of like, is it Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe, where the geezers live in one of these little things? What? Um, I can't think. Mister Tumnus from the Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe doesn't he live in a little hole under a rock like this? Yeah, they could have literally just been living spaces, yeah. If they if they went back far enough, a cave would be well, the, the a perfect shelter. The breathing problem makes me doubt the fact that they were living spaces. Yeah, but how concealed would the entrance be? I think it varies on the earth still. That's what I mean, because if you've, if you've got like a light covering or some kind of makeshift wooden door or something just to keep like uh, bears out <laughs> or something, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. You know, yeah. like, like animals, yeah, small mammals, wolves, keep small mammals out, bears, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you'd you'd think there'd be gaps. Yeah, but I'd argue that it would be easier just to build something above ground to live in. Imagine how hard it would be to yeah. hollow out stone in medieval period by hand. Yeah. Well, in medieval medieval period, they would have had tools by that point. Yeah, like pickaxes and stuff. But yeah, but they've not, they've not got machinery. Yeah, it's still done by hand, isn't it? Yeah, of course. But like, if you if they took the time to do it, again, I don't know why. That's why we're here. But <laughs> if they took the time to do it, they could have done it. And you said yeah. they were tool marks, so yeah, must have been an important reason for them to go through so much effort mm. making them. Well, I don't know. Like, what it will it could have been a preference. Like, I would argue that it's a lot safer living in a tunnel system like that and it'd be potentially cleaner because it's rock and not mud so you wouldn't get like insects and stuff in theory but it would flood but well they might not have known that it would take so long to to make this tunnel that it would flood at some point while they're making it okay true yeah you'd think so yeah so why why wouldn't they have abandoned it then if they knew it would flood halfway through why did they abandon it well why didn't they abandon it or did they abandon because it? Because if they, if they were for a specific use, which we haven't thought of, that isn't impacted by flooding, then they wouldn't abandon it, would they? 
I suppose okay. the, the the other thing though is <laughs> no point. are are they abandoned at their current state? So were they digging, got to however far they were through, thinking we're building a really elaborate tunnel network, dug into it, then realized actually that you've hit the point of that you can't go further because it floods too much or it becomes unsafe or there's like an unavoidable So many people did this across Europe. Like these aren't connected, these are all like separate tunnels. Mm-hmm. It's not like an expansive network throughout the continent. These are isolated mm-hmm. incidents of people making tunnels for some reason. The, the only thing I can think of that is literally a word of mouth thing. So there's no, obviously, okay, obviously there's no Facebook or anything like that. Like communication would have been really difficult, but it's still believable to think that people did travel around and communicate and talk to each other, right? So what if they had an idea for, I don't know the reason, for whatever reason they chose to build this tunnel, whoever had the idea, if they spread the word, in theory, over a couple of hundred years, if not sooner than that, it could have potentially spread all over Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then it goes through a bit of a phase where it's like, it's a fad. People do it, realize that there are fundamental problems with these and abandon them. And that's why they were stopped. Oh, that's, I don't know, yeah, because there's no... You, it could just be as simple as being a storage or, or a shelter or a defensive mm-hmm. shelter. But So you know. guys have kind of explained what my thinking is. So I'll say that um, when I was researching this, I was trying to think about what they could be used for. And the conclusion I came to was that they're temporary hiding places so if you're being pillaged or something like that, you take shelter in these. And they were in vogue for a couple hundred years, maybe. And then people, it came so commonplace that the, the barbarians would know that they've gone into an herd stall. And then mm. they like block the entrance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then after that, people stopped using them because they were just a waste of time. Right. Yeah, because if they're going to take so long to build and then they're actually really easily, um, like, uh, I was trying to think of. Thwarted? Yeah, thwarted, yeah. That's exactly the right word. Yeah, it's pointless, isn't it? So people yeah. would very quickly stop wasting their efforts, especially because mm-hmm. it's going to take a lot of manpower. Definitely. I know that we've, I think we would have had organic material found, but I guess none of the 2000 have been used as a burial chamber, have they? I didn't no. find anything in my research about that. Because no. you think if they were looking for archaeological pieces, they would have dug or looked hard for skeletons. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether or not it could have been um, a way of disposing of bodies that were not worthy of a funeral. So maybe prisoners. But then, like... but then you'd still find remains. Well, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know how long it takes in that. I don't know. How... I'm, what, all I'm wondering is because it's below, often below the waterline, will decomposition of things happen much more significantly and therefore leaving very little evidence? rather than it being, like, fossilised traditionally. Hmm. I mean, it's definitely possible, but since there's so many of them, you'd yeah. think you'd find a skeleton in one of them, if they were for that use. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. That's really yeah. bugging me now. Thanks for bringing that one to the table. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, mate. That's just what I wanted was to, be after the first one, be like, right, okay, I'm already annoyed. <laughs> I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Ten hours of research on this. <laughs> Which is what this episode's for, right? To give yeah. people little snippets of things they can look into. So Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Ah. Interesting. Cool. So who's up next? Uh I'll go next. I've sure. got a more I've got more of a traditionally kind of themed one. So I've got a murder mystery kind of story. Um so it has a reasonably accepted conclusion, but one that actually the more research I did, the more I disbelieved it. So I've got the case of the death of Mary Jane Barker. So this is set February 25th, 1957. Uh, It's around about Mm -hmm. a four-year-old girl who's from Belmore, New Jersey, who went missing along with her playmate's dog. So she's a four-year-old girl who was last seen at 10.30 a.m. on Monday, the 25th of February, 1957. She disappeared with a four-month-old black spaniel puppy. She'd been seen playing in a nearby yard and she'd gone to meet a friend and neighbour who was six-year-old Maria Frita, who was the puppy's owner. 
Around about 1.30 that day, police were notified that the child had not been seen since then and that she had been reported as missing. And the initial presumption was that she'd been uh, kidnapped and the police started a forensic search. As part of that search, the following day, some footprints were found along uh, a nearby stream bank, which looked like it had a man, a child and dog prints all uh, tracking up the edge of the river. Ooh. And the footprints of the child matched the tread of the shoes that the little girl was presumed to have been wearing because they were the, the shoes that she'd last been seen with. Ooh. Okay. So once the press had got hold of the uh, case of a missing child, a manhunt went underway. So on the first night, more than 200 civilians searched all around the local area to where she lived. And eventually, over the course of the search, there were more than 1,000 people involved. Well, On the 27th of February, so two days afterwards, so we're now on Wednesday, a television appeal was made asking for a potential kidnapper to leave the child in the nearest church. Um, a local child molester called Vern Lovering, who was 43, uh, was questioned and admitted being in the vicinity of the Barker home. And then later on, a phone call to the police sparked the FBI to become involved after somebody wanted £500 ransom for uh, the ch a child to be returned safely. And this happened on the 2nd of March, so around about a week later. Who did they send the ransom to? Uh, so they'd rung the police and said... Uh, we want £500 and we'll return the girl. Right. It wasn't mm. like uh, we cut out letters and stuck them to a piece of paper? No, it was a, no. No, it was a, it was a phone call to the police. Okay. Basically saying that they had the child. Yeah. But from an unknown person, and I couldn't find much about whether or not that ransom really had much mm -hmm. outcome. And they couldn't trace phone calls back then, I assume? No, no, mm. I presume not, yeah. Um, the FBI then questioned Lovering, the child molester, uh, but they didn't think that any significant progress was made as part of questioning him again. So, unfortunately, the body was discovered on the 3rd of March, 1957, of this four-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. by chance, Maria, who is um, Mary Jane's friend, went with her mother to a vacant home, which was a newly brought ranch of uh, an uncle and auntie of Maria's family. Uh, and it happened to be next door to Maria's home. Maria reportedly opened a bedroom closet door and outbounded the puppy. Wait, alive? Alive. In a seated position in the closet was the body of Barker, the hood of her blue coat partially covering her blonde hair. She was in the same clothes as the day she disappeared, and the closet was empty of dog urine and feces, despite the four-month-old puppy not being house-strained. The puppy was in an fi absolutely fine condition, prompting belief at that point that the dog had been recently fed. So the house itself that she was found in had been searched three times. At no point had anybody who searched it checked the closet that she was finally in. Every other room and, and its cupboards and closets were all checked, but because this was a downstairs room, they didn't think that anyone would be in there, and apparently it was just overlooked. At one point, a reverend, Harry McIntyre, had checked the bedroom closets but had stated, I concentrated on the basement, believing that the girl might have fallen down the stairs. And a volunteer fireman called John Reeves searched that bedroom exactly, but didn't notice a closet. So it's already well, a bit this bizarre. This is terrifying. This is already yeah, a bit I, bizarre, isn't it? You said the, the way you explained it, I actually got goosebumps then. Yeah. <laughs> that was quite chilling. I don't like that. Should we move on? We're too yeah. scared. Yeah, next. <laughs> <laughs> um. So the closet itself, so it had an unlocked door. However, from the inside, the way that the lock was designed, for a four-year-old, it would have been very difficult to have been able to pinch the handle mechanism. So it had basically had a uh, normal knob on the outside that you would twist, but on the inside, it was just the back of a screw. So it would have had like a small square shape that twisted when the knob twisted, mm -hmm. but obviously from the inside, you can't really grab the screw. What? Um, so many questions. So many questions. I don't know where to start. Like <laughs> it, the thing that I'm picking up on is that she must have been put there after the searches. Yeah, that's okay. what came to my mind as well. Okay, hold that. Thought because then. there's okay because hold there's no thought. feces and urine from the dog or even the kid. How long were they missing? Uh, at the time that they were found, they'd been missing for six days. 
six, oh, Jesus Christ. So there, there would have been, it's disgusting, but there would have been feces and urine from both the puppy and the child. Yeah, so, presumably. Oh. One of the mysteries, one of the mysteries. Um, the closet also had a hole in it, uh, in the top of the f- uh, door frame, which would have made suffocation impossible. Um, okay. And there were scratch marks found on the inside of the door. Oh, I was going to ask if there was. Terrifying. And some, basically some imprints in the plaster of the walls of the inside of the closet. Scratch marks from a dog or a, or the kid? I think from both. Right, okay. So after the body's discovered, she goes to autopsy, which showed that there was nothing in the girl's stomach, and the only thing in her digestive tract at all was chocolate milk that she'd had on the day of her disappearance. However, there were no signs of foul play or violence, and they thought that she'd probably been alive for three days, and she actually would have died on her birthday. At that point, the cause of death was deemed starvation and exposure, and I think what they mean by starvation is a general term, which would probably have referred to dehydration as well. Dehydration, yeah. So what's exposure? Exposure would be the cold. So it was February in an empty house. Unheated, yeah. Unheated, yeah. She's trapped in a... So this is 1957, right? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Because I've got a different picture in my head of the sort of place and stuff. But I don't know. I don't think it's relevant to what I'm thinking anyway. Because okay. I was just kind of thinking, like, what kind of house would it be? Would it be like, I don't know. It was what like a. New it was Jersey. described as a ranch. I'm picturing like a wooden, very wooden, yeah, American, maybe three story house, quite a big one, mm-hmm. with a lot of land. And then you, when you say closet, I was thinking like again, like slatted sort of doors that you could probably see out of, or was it like thick, heavy? I think it was a he- like a proper solid door. Okay. Um, as part of the autopsy, the dog was actually later euthanized as well, uh, because they thought there was Aww. evidence that the dog might have been fed, but actually they thought that the dog had probably been starved for the duration that the child was missing as well. Okay. But was there That's any starved. signs that the dog was, what, is, it, is it, is it possible at all that the dog would have been able to last longer than the kid in terms of starvation? So I think... I think generally, from reading, yes. Okay. I think some reports said that the dog looked like it was on its last legs, and it, as soon as it escaped, it was like its last stand, if you see what I mean. Okay, and then okay, once okay. it was fed and watered, the dog. So potentially they could have been in there, but then the kid and the dog would have been fed when they went missing. So, if they had been trapped in there that entire time, there still would have been. Some kind of defecation. They whatever. they couldn't have been in there. There's no mess. Like I was thinking, maybe if the the kidnapper had a bucket for the girl, but they but it wouldn't work for the dog. So, okay, hang on. So I, I kind of want to ask about why we were holding the thoughts. So I just want to like recap. Then, when I was talking about that, then I wasn't thinking of a kidnapper. I was thinking that the kid got himself trapped. Oh, okay. Potentially. That from that aspect, like they've gone into the house for whatever reason, they got trapped in the closet. Which would explain no foul play, but it wouldn't explain. But it explained the scratches trying to get out and stuff. But then, if there was a kidnapper, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you're on the you're on the very good lines. On very good lines. The last bit, basically, that I've got is the bits that I found were unexplained, and then the theories that come from it for us to talk to and to see which one you think might fit in with it best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, okay. the unexplained bits that I thought overall. So, number one. The dog. So why was there no urine or feces in the closet? Now, a four-month-old puppy may well eat its own feces and urine because it's not been trained not to, and it's starving. Mm -hmm. Similarly to the girl, it may well be that she's weed and the dog has licked up the evidence. So that's that was one thing that people were uh, saying. Um, The overall, the house is a bit bit weird to me. Uh, Hang on, hang on, sorry. Did they do an autopsy on the dog? Yes. Yeah. Would they have found feces in the dog, though? So I wondered the same thing. The reports from the dog are very vague in the newspaper. Okay. Um, it, there's the newspaper clip in from the, like, New Philadelphia Journal or something like that. I've forgotten what it's called now. Um, which basically said 
the dog had been put down for them to autopsy. To um, try and find more. To try and find more evidence, yeah. yeah. But there wasn't anything really conclusive other than that they thought that the dog would, had probably been starved for the duration the child had been missing for. It would make sense that the puppy would potentially last longer as well if it was eating. Yeah, potentially. That, but go on, what's the yeah. next one? So then from the house, a couple of bits about the house. So the first thing, why was she there at all? So the house isn't that close to her own home. It's around about two blocks away. It's next door to her friend's or her pl- her playmate's house. Um, but you wouldn't think a four-year-old would be let off that far to go and play with their friends. It was 1957. Yeah, but she's mm. four, two blocks away from your house, and then the people that maybe that she was being looked after with, the playmates' parents, have then. I, I understand that as well, but again, if it's, I, I'm trying not to like stereotype, but the way I'm just envisioning it, like New Jersey, I don't know anything about that state, any specifics, whatever. But when you said ranch, I was thinking it could be in the middle of nowhere, just yeah. a small, close knit community, where. Uh, you know, nothing. Yeah, ever everyone happened. trusts everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you did say there was a a popular child molester, but <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you said that the the playmate owned the dog, right? Yeah. So what was in my head, the reason she was going there was to bring the dog back because I thought she was like dog sitting for her friend. Okay. Right, so that's that would be the reason why she's going over to her friend's house. Okay. And then either she's gone into the wrong house next door, or she's been kidnapped by someone. Mm-hmm. And then either locked in that house or taken somewhere else first and then brought back for some reason. Yeah, so that fits with the next point that I was going to make, which was the house mm-hmm. was searched. At no point did anyone find evidence of a child, or more importantly, no one heard a dog barking. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the puppy would... Go on. Yeah, weirdly, no one checked the room closet. Despite people searching the house, no one thought to search the closet inside the room. Which brings you on to, why would you not have heard the dog if it was in the closet? Why would and you why have not would heard you have a not, child? Why would you have not searched the closet? And why would you have not searched the closet? Yeah. Hmm. So then there's also the possibility of kidnap. You're right. So footprints tracking down the river were of a man, the dog, and a child. The man's footprints were never identified, uh, and it would potentially be in keeping with somebody either taking the child and the dog or uh, using the dog as bait to lure the child because the child would have recognised the puppy. So the kind of the main theories that, that I could get from this was, so kind of option one, is it just a mistaken accident that happens? So could it be that the two children were playing? The dog was present throughout this. There's an element maybe that it was like hide and seek gone wrong. The child's got stuck in the closet, can't open the door from the inside. The other child hasn't been able to find them inside the ranch. Yeah, but And has assumed they've left and gone home. Wouldn't the other kid have... Unless they were playing like, yeah, like hide and seek across the town or something... But then, if the her mate was it Maria, if yeah. she was in the same area, wouldn't she know that they got into the house, or wouldn't her mate have been able to give any clues? Yeah, possibly. Although one of the uh, one of the things about it is that she's only six. So was it a case of she's realised that her friend has got stuck and then been too scared to tell a, uh, an adult for help? Because <sighs> children freeze. Did they ever try and interview Maria? Not that I know of. Which, again, is a bit suspect if they didn't. Because mm. now I'm starting yeah. to think whoever searched is... Oh, here we go. The, the conspiracy theory has started. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. nothing adds up, does it? And I really like it. Because it... <laughs> <laughs> honestly, before you said that they found like the body and stuff, and like the, you said about the closet and whatever, I was thinking, ooh, Narnia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the one of the things is is that people, uh, some people had said on um, on like Reddit and things like that, which was that uh, when was the Chronicles of Narnia written, or when were similar books written? Is it a case of that the child has gone into the closet potentially knowing the story, 
and has got stuck. So the Chronicles ah. of Narnia were released in 1950, and the last yeah. one came out yeah, in 1956, yeah, yeah. which was the year before this happened. So people were debating, oh. could it have been just a playing accident gone wrong? The whole theory of, oh, you can go to Narnia, and you can stay in Narnia, and then the other friend has, has left, thinking, assuming that this little girl could get out of the closet and come back. Or that she'd gone to Narnia. Or that she'd gone to Narnia, <laughs> yeah. I'll have to give up, she's gone to Narnia. It would be really interesting to know if uh, the girl had actually read the books. If we could go back. <laughs> That's true, and, like, yeah. If part of the questioning could be like, look, do you have these books in your house? That's the first question we ask. <laughs> the only question. Well, no, oh, <laughs> come you, on. If you can come go on. back in time and have one question, <laughs> <laughs> have you read the Chronicles of Narnia? Tell me. <laughs> How would you rate it on a scale of one to ten? <laughs> um, so second theory is uh, more of an abduction focus. So the search was unproductive, and then uh, she was then found in the closet anyway. The theory of could she have been taken by the person that was walking down the stream? Could she have been abducted at that point? Once the person knows that the ranch has been searched, who is maybe one of these 200 civilians helping mm-hmm. with the search, she's then put in a house that's already been searched so that no one looks for her. That makes the most sense to me. Yeah, it fits with uh, potentially the dog being used as a lure the footprints following that, and also the lack of dog waste and human waste at the scene. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to know the surrounding terrain, whether it's like forested or anything like that. Yeah, I'm not sure, sorry. So they they never caught anyone, they never found out about the ransom or took it further or anything like that? Oh yeah, the ransom, I forgot about that. that. But that ransom could have been fake. Yes. Get some money. I think it was accepted as fake. Hmm. Because the way that you'd, for some reason, my head, when you mentioned the ransom, straight away went, right, okay, it's someone just jumping on the bandwagon, trying to make a quick 200 quid. Yeah. yeah. Which would have been a lot more in 1957, yeah, right? It was $500 was the ransom. $500. So that'd be about five grand, potentially more equivalent. Yeah, I don't know. But I'm it assuming it was a, re- good, a big amount of money. Yeah. Mm hmm. The other thing that might fit in with her being abducted is that she could have been in the closet when the house was searched. But if you've been abducted by somebody, you're not going to shout out about where you are if you've managed to escape and hide. I don't know, because if you're if someone's searching a house, they're going to be shouting a name. Yeah, but then so the would you The puppy abducted. wouldn't be able to be quiet. There you go. So that's the bit the that puppy doesn't fit with that. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't explain yeah. the puppy. So and there the puppy... also was scratching, which implies that they want out. Yeah, yeah, and they would imply that there would have been noise from scratching. Yeah. Yeah, I my my initial thought was kidnapping and that third theory you put out with them bringing them back to the house which has already been searched. Yeah, I think that's, that's the most realistic. That's ri- ringing out to me. Yeah. But the final one that I've got, which you may or may not wonder. Um, so the other thing is, is it could it be just very juvenile behaviour? So the puppy was Maria's, but Mary Jane was, was the one that had been, been playing with it. So it's whether or not there was an element of jealousy. So she could she have been locked in the cupboard and left and then the child has returned back to it? Because the thing that we've not touched on is, so eventually Maria's mum just randomly rocks up at this house and finds this missing girl in a closet. It's like, why were they why did they return? Why did they return to that house in the first place? Has Maria said something? Maybe I last saw her in this cupboard. Yeah. yeah, and the mum's And then the mum would daughter. be completely protecting the daughter. Yeah. But then it doesn't explain why they didn't search the closet in the first place. Like, it could it could legit just be human error in haste. They missed this closet, thinking, yeah. well, why would we search it? But I get that, but it doesn't... I don't know. You said it was searched twice or three times, right? Searched three times, that Yeah, no way in hell did they miss it. No way in hell. Although the people who did the search reported that they didn't check that closet. They, ag- yeah, they acknowledged that they that's didn't look in the closet. They three, didn't times, check it at all. three times they chose not to search that specific closet. Why? Mm-hmm. Or they did, and then they found it, and they were like, oh, yeah, let's... But that, that wouldn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense to me, unless they were in on it. But then if the mum found the body and the puppy and stuff, then what if she put them there? Maybe. Because, well, I don't, I don't know. It's difficult to know what motive the mum would have for it, though. 
but the cause of death was listed as exposure and starvation. So it, if someone was abducted, she then died of exposure and starvation under an abductor, if you see what I mean. So yeah. whoever abducted her, if she was abducted, had no intent of keeping her alive because she wasn't fed and watered. Mm-hmm. So it was like she the, she was always going to die of that same issue, but it's whether she was abducted or whether or not it was just a very innocent um, an innocent event that had left her being All right, trapped in this we, closet. Should we wrap that up, or do we want to give our opinions first and then you give what's widely accepted as sure? The yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I I do think it's a abduction. She was kept somewhere else and then she was put there. I reckon. The way the the closet wasn't searched specifically, they could have not searched other parts of the house, admittedly, but the fact that it was almost avoided three times tells me that it's a big, the greater good thing from Hot Fuzz where everyone's in on it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm serious. (laughs) I I mean it. (laughs) Great big bushy beard. No, uh, all those signs are kind of pointing that to me. And the fact that Maria found uh, Maria's mum found the body, I'm not suggesting that she was actually the one who did it. She could have genuinely been the one who found it when they were ready to move in. Or mm. she could have been the one who put the, the kid there. But it's just the fact that they didn't search the closet. If you'd have told me that they searched the house top to bottom, took the walls down, stripped it, fair enough, I wouldn't suspect them. But it's the people who searched the house that I'm not. They they would have put them there after, knowing that it had been Fair searched, enough. or one of yeah. the one of the people. Uh, I agree with Sean. I think it's sort of a kidnapping thing because uh, I don't see how a four year old breaks into a house like that. Really, I think you'd have to have some sort of grown up intent to get into a building like that. It's the fact that the room is clean as well. Like I don't agree that the dog would have cleaned it all up. No, perfectly. they would have seen something. They would have smelled yeah. it. There, there would be stains on the clothes. Yeah, and they they would have smelled it, surely. Yeah. Fair enough. It must have been put there after. So what do you think, Stu? So I find it a confusing one. I think that overall it's probably more of an accident than something... Um, I hope, well, I hope it's an accident rather than something malicious. I, I like the whole, she could have been playing with a friend. She's got locked in the cupboard. Friend is panicked, run away, not told parents, just because that's how children behave. But like you said, it doesn't explain the missing bits of the feces and why no one would have searched the room. The accepted theory seems to be that it was just a case of she locked herself in and wouldn't have been able to get herself out. I think because the house was empty, it may not have been as secure as we're debating it because no one was living in the property. So it was an empty property of a family member of this little girl. So she might have just been quite happy walking in and out. I don't think it was like a building site. I think it was ready to go. They just not moved in yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if she has just innocently got trapped in a cupboard. She's only there for six days, wouldn't she? So yeah, they wouldn't have been building it still while they were ready to move in. No, no. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, one bit that I've I've missed off my notes. Sorry, actually, from reading out. Um, some uh, an engineer had attended the property and never heard a dog or a uh, a little girl shouting out. There you go. Um, so while they were servicing the house, basically a fourth search, in theory. Yeah, yeah, not a direct search, but he also didn't search, hear anything he... of concern. Yeah, was that after the searches? Uh, it was after she'd gone missing. Okay, uh, I don't the exactly know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure actually. Thing, right? okay. Yeah. Either way, it's a fourth option for someone to have heard something. So that is more interesting because it takes away my theory of it not being searched. But again, she might have just been keeping quiet because she, she'd been abducted. And at that point, whoever servicing the house would not have been loud. They wouldn't have been searching for anyone. They would have kept quiet, naturally. No. Mm-hmm. But you'd expect for a dog to hear noise in a close vicinity for it to bark. And that's maybe still the, the sticking maybe point. Maybe the dog sensed the kid's fear and also shut up. There's that as well. So puppies maybe. are uncontrollable, but they're still alive, aren't they? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'm not buying it. No, <laughs> didn't think you would. And that's why it's a good one. It's a good yeah, one. It's great. a really good one. That was both incredibly interesting and also incredibly depressing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Glad we didn't finish on that one. Shall we go to number three then? Right then, 
so the thing I'm bringing to the table is HAARP, which is H-A-A-R-P. It's the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project. The F is silent. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that far. <laughs> um, I've only just noticed that, actually. I was like, hang on, where's the F in the abbreviation? <laughs> Okay, so just, it's... <laughs> can we erase the word out to make it a better acronym? Yeah, yeah. It's probably like a lowercase f somewhere that they just... Yeah. Anyway, it's in... <laughs> he's usually muted himself. <laughs> but this oh, is prime laughter. For sake, it's going to be one of those where I can't stop laughing again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Right. Oh, he's self -shirt. Okay, so this is a research program. Uh, or research facility, sorry, based in Gakona, Alaska. And it was built, or construction began, sorry, in 1993, and it was finished in 1994. So HARP is a research program designed to analyze the ionosphere, a portion of the upper atmosphere that stretches from about 53 miles or 85 kilometers above the surface of the Earth to 370 miles or 600 kilometers up. The program has been funded by the Air Force, Navy, the University of Alaska, and DARPA, the Defense DARPA, Advanced yeah. Research Projects Agency. So, right, I'll be straight up. This is what the government says that it is. So the U.S. military is interested in the ionosphere because this portion of the atmosphere plays a role in transmitting video signals. HARP sends radio okay. beams into the ionosphere to study the responses from it. One of the few ways to accurately measure this in accessible part of the, the atmosphere. So the military obviously want to use it for communications. Um, and it's basically just a research facility where they, it's, oh, I don't, I've got the exact number. I'm sure someone said it's like, it's about 60 acres. It's a huge portion of land mm -hmm. um, covered in transmitters. So you've got like big, I think there's 126 masts. I think that's correct. So 126 masts, and they're all like they're all like connected by a wire mesh. And for me, in, initially, it looked kind of like a power station, but then you can see it hasn't got. Like, oh yeah, it really does, doesn't and, it? Yeah, yeah. And that thing is massive. It's huge. whoa, it's huge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like in the middle of a forest. Oh, I always picture Alaska as very snowy. This is like yeah, a, a forest. Well, it's not always snowy. It's yeah, like so. There's a good picture here which has got the forest and then in the background a snowy mountain. Yeah, mm. on Wikipedia is the one I'm looking at. So, uh, HARP, as you can see, it has a high power radio frequency transmitter that can perturb a small portion of the atmosphere. Other instruments are then used to measure the perturbations. Per perturbations. Yep. So, the, the idea of what it wants to do is disturb the atmosphere and they send up I imagine it to be like microwaves. The way that it was kind of one of the best ways that I was, it was described that I found is if you get your microwave, like an actual microwave, and then open the door open and turn the door. it on, you can direct yeah. the microwave radiation. So that's basically what it does on a much grander scale. And they can focus a lot of the energy into one small section. And I'm sure it uses like three point six megawatts but they can focus it into a gigawatt which is a lot more <laughs> or something like there's no actual energy used for the amount of energy that gets focused onto this one section right okay i want to preface this before we go on i left out a lot of the science because it's oh, way I'm above my head as a physicist yeah there, I'm is bits lost. That I pick up. there is bits that i pick up but long story short it's a big massive transmitter of radio frequencies. Yeah. And You're trans I think transmitting you... really high frequency um, waves and to try and elicit a response, aren't you? And extra low. So ELFs as well. Not okay. just really extreme high. It also looks into extreme low. Okay. To try and see if there's a response from the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you said this was for the purpose of communication. Specifically, it's for researching how the ionosphere works so basically okay. it is all it's, it affects the weather the ionosphere is it affects the weather and a lot of other things uh, the the magnetic uh field field of the earth thank you 
So like when it, it gets hit by the sun, and it's obviously it's one of the things that protects us from the sun's radiation. For example, obviously the atmosphere does that, but um, it's part of that, and it's where a lot of the electrical charge is held. It's where lightning uh, is discharged is, from, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The ions. Oh, ions I feel like I know so, where this is going. I mean, lightning bolts from the sky. So, I'll go straight into the the conspiracies then, or like some of the ideas behind it. The general public hated it because they thought a lot of different things. So straight away, everyone... Okay, so name a natural phenomenon, and someone probably suspects half of being behind it. Tsunami. Climate change. Uh, so climate Fire. change. Flat, uh, maybe not that. <laughs> <laughs> it's flattened out the earth. <laughs> natural phenomenon. You've microwaved uh, the earth and it's just sunk into a puddle. <laughs> it's gone completely flat. So... Conspiracy theorists suggest that HAP was to blame for the 2011 earthquake and tsunami in Japan. Yeah, uh, the Moor, I don't know what the Moor is, Oklahoma, tornado of 2013, a landslide in 2006 in the Philippines, and many more natural disasters. Um, so in 2010, Venezuelan leader Hugo Chavez claimed that HAP or a program like it triggered the Haiti earthquake. Haiti. Okay. Haiti. Haiti. Okay, so from my, my knowledge of earthquakes, which I do have a degree in, uh, <laughs> I'm, an earthquake, I'm an earthquakeologist. <laughs> okay, go on. Well, I've I've looked into the Japan tsunami quite a lot, and it was caused by a a shift in the tectonic plate. Yeah, it, it, I remember that the pressure kept building up, and eventually the plate kind of flicked back up or something. Yeah, like it's a bit more a bit less cartoonish than that, but. In theory, Apparently that did actually happen, yeah, and it slid back up, and the huge amount of water above it, it had the power to lift it and created the tsunami. So I should say as well, some of the conspiracy theorists are actual scientists, like physicists and people who've been researching in the field. Oh, there is yeah, actually... Sure, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, seriously. The um, thing is, though, if you if you know a lot about a subject, you're much more likely to raise concerns about that aren't you so i guess yeah. the more the people who are high profile in their field should be the people that are concerned rather than mm -hmm. sean from north wales <laughs> typing on reddit they found me i shall retreat to my uh install <laughs> <Right. laughs> i have one which we installed right now yeah <laughs> right the the idea being a lot of the theories around it in terms of the weather those sort of natural, natural disasters and tornadoes and stuff, the idea being that people are worried. And if you think about it, they're sending frequencies up to the ionosphere, heating it up. That's the intention. They're heating it up to disturb it. And one of the things they wanted to do, if you imagine like there's a perfect sphere around the world, they wanted to focus on one bit of it, on, of the ionosphere specifically, to raise it up, like a, a herniate it. Is that actually a good word? Yeah. Yeah. And he ate it, so like there's like a bit that lifts up. And they wanted they wanted to like test what would happen and stuff like that. And like the actual parts of the team of this documentary, I did actually watch a documentary this time. Like <laughs> you Yay. know, for the for the other one where I didn't actually watch the film about it, but this time I actually found something and it was actually really interesting. <laughs> it has a lot of uh, it, it, it's called Holes in Heaven, and it's basically a, a, a bit of a mix of a conspiracy. It's kind of what we do. It was like at the end of the 1990s, after a lot of the big things have come out about it, it's got interviews with the project manager, the PR relations guy for Harp, um, the guy who, we'll talk about him in a second, Dr. Bernard Eastland. He's the guy who made the patent for it, but isn't actually included in like Harp itself. And then it talks to a load of other people who were conspiracy theorists, they're against it. It does talk to a lot of, um, it talks to a native of Alaska and she's just kind of like an old woman that's just like, yeah, there's been a lot more earthquakes and natural disasters recently. That heart facility is at it again. You know what I mean? Mm. I don't take a lot of what she says. It literally yes, says, she's a, it literally says representative Alaska. So she's representing Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't take her word for a lot of things, but there are a lot of people. She's now the leader of Alaska. Yeah, the, the people who, uh, there's two co-writers of a book called Angels Don't Play This Harp, 
Nah. <laughs> I nah. thought that was pretty cool. But they basically are the... They've wrote a book on it, obviously, on why they think it's there's more to it. So I don't know what your thoughts are specifically on it at the moment, but obviously I want to point out that it's funded by the military. So we talked, obviously, in my last... Like the one I hosted last, uh, the Philadelphia Experiment, there was kind of like a push for all the military involved in it. The military funded this, or like a, one of the main funders. So yes, okay, on the face of it, they would be like communications. You know, we want to learn how we can send signals up or scramble signals. There's there's a lot of talk. There's so much like things they want to test or they have tested. Yeah, but I don't know why when people hear that the military is funding something, they instantly think the worst. Like, everyone assumes that the military wants to destroy all of humanity for some reason. Well, I think the assumption is normally based on the fact that if the military are funding something, that's because they think there's a either defence or offence application to its use, isn't it? Rather than it being funded by, I don't know, agricultural industry. Yes. In theory, they would want to not necessarily weaponize it, but defensively use it. So this is why I want to introduce Dr. Fuck, what was his name? Dr. Bernard, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dr. Bernard Eastland. Uh, he, in 1987... Is he here right uh, now? Is he our first guest? Hi, mate. How's it going? <laughs> I want to introduce <laughs> Dr. Bernard Eastland. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, like an I've just got intro. this idea in my head of this guy sitting next to Sean. <laughs> Sean be like, <laughs> Isn't that this whole time? What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> so hey, how's it going, Bernard? Hey, may I do? Um, he originally patented the idea for Harp, and he was given the patent. And one of the things that the ideas he had for it was defensively. He had loads of different ideas of what he wanted to do with it, and I will find you some of the things. So one thing I found interesting, because obviously we do have a geologist, and then Stuart, you're a doctor. There's evidence or research to show the effects of frequencies and electromagnetic waves on humans, specifically okay. the brain. So yeah. one of the things that was part of the uh, patent that he introduced was to provide a technique for producing a subliminal presentation, which is inaudible to the listeners, yet is perceived and demodulated or decoded by the ear for use by the subconscious mind. So basically, selling you Coca-Cola from a long distance. No. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, sending out subliminal messages for potentially mind control purposes or suggestion. Or um, in this documentary, it really highlighted there was a biophysicist that went into quite a bit of detail on how there's obviously electric signals in the brain. And if you can match the frequencies of the different chemicals that make certain emotions. I, this, this is why I left out a lot of science, but I wanted mm. to kind of like back it up with what they were saying because it sounded pretty like, oh, Jesus Christ, yeah, maybe. And it's not just harp. There is research and stuff before and after this to look into, well, maybe the, they can make sort of um, like drones that people don't know are there. They perk people up or they make everyone feel down and depressed. And it's a massive transmitter. And it's very convenient to say, well, we're just sending waves up to see if we can affect the ionosphere, which in itself mm. on the surface of it is quite scary because one of the people in the documentary described it as uh, like a trigger of a gun. So the, the butterfly effect or whatever, if you affect one thing, it'll spark a massive energy surge or something will happen in another aspect. So potentially there's a big disaster waiting to happen. And all you need to do is hit a certain frequency and it'll send a hundred times, you know, every single ion in the ionosphere will concentrate on this one area and potentially be a huge global disaster. There's loads of like theories around that and worries. And in this case, there's all right. Okay. Obviously humanity is always going to want to learn more or want to discover more, right? It's just in human nature mm -hmm. and the idea that they're playing with this is one of the first like science things where I've really gone, mm, yeah, maybe that is a bit dangerous <laughs> yeah. because they, but the thing is when they built it, 
they had and the project manager who's leading or led it at the time i should point out at the time of that documentary which was the end of 1990s or the start of the noise they had no idea what was going to happen i thought you were going to say they killed him no they have no idea they had no idea <laughs> no they had they had no <laughs> idea what was going to happen absolutely no idea it, it's science at the end of the day they were experimenting with it yeah so there's so another thing that i found interesting alex you might be able to help with this again oh, God. so uh, it's ge- uh, geology so oh, God. one claim uh one part of this documentary stated if you're that you're able to search for natural gases and crude oils and stuff below the surface yep. sure like relatively short range but they can send um a certain amount of like frequencies down and mm-hmm. then when it hits a certain thing and it, it's radar basically right yeah you hit the floor of a big hammer i've done it myself it's fun what you get a big sky hammer and you hit the floor and it sends out seismic waves and then you detect them on a machine called a seismograph oh. and then you can see a picture of the underground that's cool that's so cool okay it's okay that, well. that sounds like quite rudimentary the way of doing it but it's pretty rudimentary <laughs> Yeah, but if it works, it works, right? So what what they're saying, though, is with this, with, with like, transmitters, on a very, very small-scale version of HARP, they can send down frequencies, and then when it bounces back, they'll get a certain... Sometimes they'll get a certain frequency, which sounds like a, you know, a piano note that's audible, and then they'll know, you know, he used it as an analogy, but he'll be like, right, okay, that's natural gas, because they know the frequency that, that... what they've sent down, what it'll come back as, depending on how it's resonated, right? So he's saying that they were able to do that with 30 watts of energy. Harp is using a lot more than that. Like, it concentrated a billion watts, which is a gigawatt. 1.21 gigawatts is how much you need to time travel. <laughs> the coins of Back to the Future. The coins of Back to the Future, there you go. <laughs> 1.21 gigawatts. Uh... So, <laughs> I just want to throw that in there. Right, so basically what he's saying is the amount of power required required to do this sort of thing is minimal you don't need that much power but they're sending out a f- hell of a lot don't get me wrong like he's saying what if you pointed it at the ground what if they were able to actually send it down and that's where a lot of the conspiracy theories for the earthquakes and yeah. stuff come from because that if makes you're sending, a lot of sense though if you're sending down in a direction a certain amount of energy that kind of energy it's i don't know how much energy it would need to create anything like that or alex if some would there be anything powerful enough man-made to send frequencies into the earth that would create earthquakes or really heavily affect the tectonic plates to the points where it would no not tectonic plates let's not go into it too much detail but is there any way that you could affect that from with your knowledge if you send a strong enough energy wave into the ground you will cause an earthquake okay perfect so that i've got a citation from someone with a degree in this field so <laughs> i'm just going to carry on so you just confirmed that harp, harp is being used to cause natural yeah, disasters yeah sure right so let, let me just explain how they find natural gas so what they do is they'll First, go to an area where they think there's natural gas under the ground, and they'll set off an explosion above ground in the same way that I explained with the hammer. So mm. it's basically a big version of hitting a hammer on the ground. Send out these earthquake, these are seismic waves, and then they bounce off the ground and come back. And then we've got a picture of the underground. And this will be, depending on the size of the explosion, this will be several kilometers into the crust, right? Mm. And then they can see, okay, this, this area here is quite porous. It's probably going to have gas in it because the gas will be trapped in water in the pores between the, the rocks. Mm-hmm. And then what they do is they'll go to an area where they think there's gas and they'll dig a bore well, which is a big, like a, a cylinder-shaped hole, which will go down several kilometers. And then they'll get all the rocks and the crap out of that. And then they can look at the rocks under microscopes and see if there's oil trapped in the pores or gas or whatever. So that's how they find gas. They don't use a frequency which hits the gas and makes a sound, or whatever you described it as. Mm-hmm. So, for example, in quarries, they use explosions to mine the rock, right? 
and that sets off seismic waves, which can be picked up as earthquakes. But these yeah. will be very low magnitude earthquakes. Yeah, like you, won't, you won't feel them standing on the ground, but they'll be picked up by seismographs. Mm -hmm. So sending a seismic wave into the ground will cause an earthquake, but it depends on the magnitude of the earthquake. Would you be able to direct it? Because obviously they can direct half. As far as I know, it's only upwards. But if they were able to turn it downwards, would they be able to send it through to the other side of the Earth, to Japan, for example? Um, earthquake waves start at a central point and they go outwards in every direction at the same magnitude. Mm -hmm. So you can't point them in a direction. Um, in large earthquakes that happen naturally, they can be detected on the other side of the Earth. And that's how we have estimations of the interior of the Earth, you know, the layers, the outer core, and the core mantle, okay. and all that. Oh, earthquakes can be detected from the other side of the Earth. They can, if they're large enough. If you've got eight magnitude, nine magnitude. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the equipment to obviously record it, but still, yeah, okay. Yeah, a sensitive size of graph. Yeah, so if they did have it powerful enough, to, if they directed a wave down powerful enough, it would probably just create an earthquake underneath them. Yeah. Right, okay. Never mind then. Yeah, I was going to say, you presumably would have picked up on that because if they were to test this, you'd have a sequence of earthquakes being picked up from exactly the same point frequently, wouldn't they? Because they, these would be presumably tests, like formal tests. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. It wouldn't just be one separate event. They'd have to test how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, because you wouldn't know how much energy that you need and things like that, would you? No. Have they actually got any like tangible outcomes that they've got? For example, since this project's been running since 1994, is there actually anything that they have said, oh, thanks to Harp, we've discovered this, or we've found this? That's like I, major I profile. I couldn't find anything. That's just weird. Like, But that's not... That is a good question. I mostly search for the conspiracy side of things, but the conspiracy is kind of still going on. Um, right, so th this is a kind of answering your question it was officially shuttered by the military in 2013 so i think what that means is that it was it lost funding so it was just given up on by the military but then later in i think 2015 16 it was bought by a university so it's currently running under a university it was a uh, university of alaska in 2015 yeah okay so that makes it less sinister now I guess. Yeah, because now it's demilitarized, isn't it? Yeah. The initial closure of Harp in 2013 was met with a lot of negativity and it was What they didn't want in the first place. Well no, 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 no. In, in terms in terms of like, well hang on, why are you shutting it down? Because that's a perfect way to oh well you shut it down now, we won't we'll stop looking. You know what I mean? So mm. they they there was the conspiracy theorists that were like well, okay, yeah, you've just shut it down, but now we're just thinking, why would you? It's been going for years. Like, wouldn't you keep doing your research? And No, exactly. It's been going for a long time. They've probably run out of stuff to test. Yeah, it's been going best part of 20 years. More uh, than 20 uh, sorry, years. Sorry, the closure provided the excuse to stop the live broadcasting of Harp signals on a public website. So that's why, because it right. was all public. You can actually, um, I think you can YouTube what the signal sounded like. And it's not anything special, it just sounds like a, a tone. Demilitarizing it, though, is a very good cover to say, we're giving it back to the university because we've done everything we can with it, but actually what we want to do is distract people's attention from the fact that we've now found a military thing for it and we want to take our name off it. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that I picked up on, which was quite funny, watching that documentary, if you do watch it or if anyone does watch it, I got a really shifty feeling. I'm not joking, I'm not trying to stir the pot. The project manager, I felt like he was just, he was trying to answer the questions. He could just not be a people person. He could be not, he could not be an interview person. But the way he was answering questions was just like a bit shifty. So like they were talking about like, is Harp safe? And he said, uh, well, it's as safe as it can be. And stuff like that, that kind of <laughs> like well, we follow all the uh, the uh, what's it called? Um, we we follow all the safety measures. We um, we follow the environmental impact statement. I think that was what they said. Mm. And 
in that they basically said it's basically a compact that they've signed. I'm guessing a lot of companies and all these sort of yeah, it's a contract. No, a compact, compact. <laughs> what you say, compact? Yeah, yeah. That's a right, compact is like a it's like a a thing that you sign to say I'm oh, going to do this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's the extension it's of not, the word pact. It, yeah, it's a contract in the way that it's a set of guidelines you're signing to say that you will follow. Oh, a compact. I thought you were just messing up your words again. No. <laughs> oh, hey, funny. <laughs> coffee, 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 coffee. I've got it now. Coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they, they were saying that they've signed all this, but then there was other evidence to show that the safety guidelines that they're following, they made up. That's great. <laughs> so it's like, well, right, okay, another thing. Lit- the guy literally be going, well, I mean, it's not unsafe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That he said that. I'm, I'm sure he said that. It's like, well, it's not unsafe. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> we're we're not sending any dangerous amounts of radiation into the sky to affect the ionosphere that holds a lot of energy and you know stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, the the original patent from Bernard. This is next to you asking what his name is. From this, Doctor is this... Bernard. <laughs> Doctor Fuck, this voice <laughs> name is. I, I can't I can't bother scrolling all the way back up. Um, he basically had all these different ideas for like and he did say in the documentary his original patent had a lot of defensive military weaponry sort of things specifically for scrambling radio signals mm. yeah that um, makes sense it came to my mind when you first yeah. described yeah. it yeah but then also in the same patent it talks about that um subliminal you know in layman's terms subliminal messaging and being able to direct messages to people's brains yeah mm. and suggest i imagine these are uh, loads of things that they, they thought of that they could test and yes. like that would be useful for a military to be able to do yeah however he had no part in when they actually built it six or seven years later so it was patented in 87 construction started in 93 and he had no part in the project even though yeah he painted well he, he might have um just moved on i mean seven years is a long time yeah right? yeah so he talks about the project, which is interesting. He actually gets interviewed, so a lot of the sources come from the guy who painted it in the first place. Mm-hmm. But the project manager and the HR guy, specifically the project manager, say they did not follow the things in the patent. So they, they took the idea, but they're not using harp for the reason. For its in intended patent, purpose. Or some of the intended purposes. Yeah, because maybe some of the, those things were just unreasonable to test. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it might, be, it might be that they drew the ethical line. You would, yeah, or the, definitely the ethical line. I mean, you know, especially because they made it public as well. So, yeah. But what weren't they making public? There, there's a lot of, like, people are really funny with this. Um, I, mm. As I was actually sure reading are, it and but... looking into it, I was like, well, yeah, it sounds like some of this is really dodgy. There's other things to say that they would want to keep it secret if it was military-based or if it was potentially money-making. So one of the ideas or in the original painting and stuff like that, I think it, they said they wanted to test if they could harness energy from the ionosphere. So literally harness lightning. Oh, they could become... The thing is, light, lightning farms, though, have been talked about for a long time, haven't they? Yeah. The idea oh, being uh, that here's, here's a, massive... a callback to the pyramids. So Nikolai Tesla did tests on it, didn't he? And ways of sending energy up to the ionosphere, sending it to a receiver on potentially the other side of the world. I mentioned that it was a theory, but the pyramids mm-hmm. basically being these transmitters and stuff like that. So there is other evidence of it being used, and HARP is potentially a modern conspiracy theory on that being the case as well. Yeah. yeah. But it's the same with like the Hadron Collider, the CERN hadron collider like that mashes things together but there's so many intended purposes of it but yeah apparently you can control the weather and mind control people Mm. i i can see the controlling the weather thing being potentially realistic in the sense that i wonder if you could precipitate a lightning storm using it i don't think manipulating natural disasters sounds likely at all and i don't think mind control and subliminal messaging i don't see how on earth that could work the only thing i could think of that 
it would invoke in people by forcing their brain full of waves would be for them to have epilepsy and at no point did we mention that and i thought that might have been at one point where you were going from a a medical perspective because normally brain waves that go wrong provoke seizures yeah so actually there was uh research done into this not specifically harp but there was research done into it that it mentioned in the um thing and there's probably been way more research done since although it doesn't really sound that ethical obviously um the, the effect of radio waves and electromagnetic radiation on the brain and there was stuff like that that it, it caused all manner of random illnesses people had migraines people had nosebleeds i can't remember seizures but i do i it potentially could have been there because vomiting was in there nausea it made mm. people really ill um and so there was another thing about blackouts as in uh electricity blackouts when the power goes down all right there's, there's oh been, yeah i could see that yeah so there's apparent well i don't know what you what you're thinking but the i'm thinking that oh. you'd make a machine that could cause blackouts and drive it to a place you're doing war and then do a blackout in that area well an emp yeah 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 i think that is done you wouldn't make a, a facility in Alaska to shoot across the earth to do that. You take it ah, to okay. The so Alaska apparently specifically is one of the places, if not the closest place in the world to the ionosphere. Or it's the place around the earth where the ionosphere is at its lowest. Fair so enough. that's why they've done it. Okay, sure. So the blackout thing, what I was gonna say, isn't specifically to do with harp. It was research done into when the blackout happens and all the power goes down. Some people report that they feel elated or they feel less stressed and like they feel like a weight's come off their chest. And as soon as the power comes back on, they feel down again. So mm. there's been research to show that some people are actually quite a, uh, more susceptible to being affected by electricity, waves, all these sort of words. And it is, yeah. there's also research done into, you know, if you have your phone next to you or like if you have a room full of electronic devices you might sleep with yeah there's also the whole uh people who live close to it like electricity pylons and things isn't there about having exactly exactly neurogenic so problems. what they're saying harp can replicate that and direct it yeah i mean I, it sounds so it still it sounds more plausible brief. It's, it still sounds like completely far-fetched but <laughs> yeah it's it's, yeah. it's as anything you don't realize probably how far advanced the research is. Because if you've been doing something for 20 years and you've had 20 years of the sharpest minds in physics thinking about the application of this, they're going to come up with hundreds and thousands of applications that are either yeah, going to yeah, yeah. fail miserably or work. But you're not going to publish them until you've got a way of manipulating it for either financial gain or whatever it is that you want. Because that's the whole thing, isn't it? People do research to make money for power manipulation. Mm-hmm. And like, just because we've not seen a practical application yet, it might be a case of once you show that you've got technology, you lose the element of surprise with it. And that's what the issue was with various technological advances over the years, including the hydrogen bomb and things, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was going to say, especially with military research, you always want to keep it secret so that your enemy doesn't have access to it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what I was thinking of was radio stuff, like I said before, and perhaps they had made some strides in making more efficient radio connection between pilots or whatever. Maybe that was the kind of research they did, and maybe they have done that, and they're using it currently, but they don't want to tell anyone so that that other countries don't get it. But I think it's a bit doomsday-y to say that they're causing lightning strikes and tsunamis and earthquakes from this facility. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things that I picked up on from one of the conspiracy theorists who is knowledgeable in the area, officially, P admittedly did turn around and say, I know this all sounds a, f- a bit far-fetched, <laughs> when he was talking about uh, specifically how the analogy of a, a trigger being pulled on a gun, the idea that a small amount of energy triggering it fires off this weapon you know what i mean mm. and saying that this uh, shooting up the energy into the air could cause um lightning bolts a hundred times the power of a normal lightning bolt that hits like 30 times a second 
and the amount of energy that just gets distributed is like 12 times the amount of a SAR bomb or like a hydrogen bomb four times per second. And he was like, you know, I know this sounds a bit far fetched. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, well, mate, it does. I'm not going to lie. But then he was like, <laughs> well, this is the worst scenario. This is the worst case scenario that we're thinking of and stuff like that. Because they have literally, and he was like, they have no idea what they're doing. They're literally just researching. They have no idea what they're playing with. And the worrying thing as well, which it does actually have a bit of a theme in it, is the project manager. He's like, look, I get told to do this. By who? Well, the government. The, the government tell them to do it. <laughs> the giant squid. <laughs> Drop it in. Uh, from, from the government, obviously. He's just a yes man. He's just doing his job. Mm-hmm. And that's, that worried me a bit because it's like, well, the way that he's answered all these questions is worrying. I've got like a bad feeling from this guy. And I'm not trying to lie to make a story. And I wasn't pushing it when I was, you know, I wasn't lying to myself. I was like, mm, the way he's answering those questions are like, nah, he's hiding something. Yeah, something sketchy. Right there. <laughs> it, it, the, the whole thing is sketchy. On the face of it, it's it, the fact that it was, you know, publicly transmitted what they were sending out, but they were publicly transmitting over a website what they were doing, but not what results they got back or what else they were doing. That could, what they were doing could have been just a random thing. It could it could not have been a live transmission. It could have been anything. So, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think this is a bit doomsday, like I said before. Mm-hmm. I think maybe they got some use out of it, maybe they didn't. It's closed down now. The military's probably not involved with it anymore. Um, yeah. But I don't think they're causing earthquakes. And yeah. Yeah, okay. tsunamis and lightning strikes and whatever. I'm in the same yeah. boat. Yeah. I think there's, there's, they've probably found an application for it, which in the grand scheme of things hasn't been a significant enough finding. So the military have pulled out and said, yes, okay, the research is finished. We've had a tangible conclusion, but it makes no difference in the grand scheme of things. So we're no longer giving funding for it. And the university, which probably uses it as a training experience for people who are getting into the that field of physics probably to to use it as a learning experience because there's probably a lot of maths and stuff behind it that's probably really helpful in in their field but it, mm-hmm. yeah i i don't see how that i think to draw conclusions about earthquakes natural disasters and things like that i think is stretching it i'll say okay but that that is the doomsday like oh my god this is the extreme yeah. worst case scenario that people yeah. are thinking up but i think a lot of the small scale electromagnetic field manipulation in terms of not mind control, but affecting people in some way. I think that's got some weight to it. Hmm? Anyway, I'm, I'm in the same boat, but I'm a bit more speculative than you guys. A bit more open to the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's probably, for, for probably example, partly influenced by the fact that you've, you know more about it because you've watched yeah, this documentary and things yeah, like that. Yeah, so yeah. you've got you. It's the classic. Once you know a bit more information, you've got more uh, evidence to formulate a conclusion, and yeah. you've had some time to reflect on it. And your kind of subconscious has thought more about it. Yeah, yeah. But you're but also, you're much more I'm, open to it. I'm open to the idea that the U.S. government is secretive, and has proven to be secretive. So we mentioned mm-hmm. in the Philadelphia experiment thing. A lot of declassified yeah. documents came out. One of the examples that it gives here, in terms of declassified files from World War II, uh, top secret World War II wartime experiments were conducted off the coast of Auckland to perfect a tidal wave bomb. Uh, United States defense chiefs said that if the project had been completed before the end of the war, it could have played a role as effective as that of the at- atom bomb. Details of the tsunami bomb, known as Project Seal, are contained in 53-year-old documents released by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So that was a, I think that was like 10 years ago, that statement. Um, but it makes a point. So if the military secretly developed a weapon which could use a, which could cause a tsunami half a century ago, admittedly with a bomb, what kind of advanced deadly weapons might be available now? Is the statement. Yeah. And I was like, well, yeah, what if they are secretive about yeah. it? And to be honest, why wouldn't they be secretive? Exactly. Exactly. Well, why wouldn't they be secretive about anything they find? Yes, okay, there's a lot of research that goes out, but until they find something concrete, they probably wouldn't. And if they did yeah. find something, oh my god, this is dangerous, this could be weaponized, we wouldn't know about it until fifty years later, which is yeah. proven. Yeah. 
I think that's the thing that draws the conclusion under underlining this entirely, which is mm-hmm. that the government is secretive and they'll release stuff when they find a benefit significant enough to them to release mm-hmm. that finding or whatever it is, that, they, that development. Yeah, so I'll leave yep. it at that. I'm happy with that conclusion. Go yeah. watch Holes in Heaven. It was a really <laughs> we'll leave thing. it on that uplifting message about yeah. <laughs> the government across the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's better than about a child dying, I suppose, to be fair. Yeah, it is yeah. more uplifting than the second one. <laughs> Yeah. God, Jesus, Stuart. <laughs> the the Sorry, way to raise up a, a death of a child is to talk about natural disasters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> death on a larger scale. Yeah. yeah, well, I hope everyone enjoyed this little format change. Um, give us some comments, tell us on Twitter whether you think it's better or worse, whether we should do it again or stick to the, the longer single single topic things. Uh, let us know. We're, we're fine with doing whatever. Mm-hmm. Um. I will say the next one will be a, a long one because I'm balls deep working on this, this nice. next episode and I'm super excited about it and it's going to go crazy again and you two are probably going to be pretty mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> Families of a Madman is currently available on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, and YouTube. All the links are available on Twitter at Rome Podcast. That's R O A N Podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.